Hello again, welcome back everyone. Liquor Hound here with you and thank you for joining me once again for another Spirit Review video. Today we're going to be taking a look at the newest annual limited release from Old Forester, that being the 1924 10 year old. Now, if you missed out on it, don't feel bad. Again, this is an annual release that they're going to be doing. Of course, it is going to be limited, so it'll come out. It'll probably, you know, fly off the shelves within a day or two, especially here in Texas. But uh, price point on it, $125 for a 10-year-old 100-proof bourbon. Now, this is not your typical Old Forester, okay? Uh, Old Forester's mash bill here is 79% corn, 11% rye, and 10% malted barley. And the reason they did that is they say they were paying homage to, back during Prohibition, of course, all these, you know, established distilleries were closing because of it. And Old Forester was allowed to continue because they had the medicinal clause, right? And during that time, they were buying a lot of barrels from all these closed distilleries, and they were bottling them as Old Forester. So here they're trying to do a different mash bill, again, just like they would have had different mash bills back then. They're bottling it at, as Old Forester, 10-year-old. Now, the mash bill that they're using is very similar. It's actually the exact same as what Brown Foreman, or Sazerac now, was using for the early times bourbons. Now, I decided, you know what? If it's using an early times mash bill, let's go ahead and compare the current early times bottled in bond. And while we're at it, let's go ahead and compare it to the infamous black top uh, early times that they initially relaunched, Brown Foreman relaunched with back in 2017. Now the way that worked was in 2017 they're trying to kind of reintroduce the brand to the market so they decided you know what we're going to do a bottled in bond meaning it's at least four years old 100 proof and we're going to do it in a liter bottle we're going to make it Kentucky only and we're only going to charge like 20 25 dollars for it. Boom. Fantastic. So if you were you know, lucky enough to be in Kentucky during that time, 2017 to roughly 2019, um, yeah, right around there, 2020 maybe if you're lucky, you could still find the black tops on there. You could tell the difference because this is a little squattier bottle, a little more rounded on the shoulders compared to the current one. The current one's a little taller, has that blue metal top, so you'll, you'll hear people talk about the, the metal, blue metal versus the black tops on the early times. We're going to actually taste through them and see what the difference is. Now, the reason this came about was because in 2019, 20, no, no, 2020, mid 2020, uh, Brown Foreman sold the brand to Sazerac. I want to say it was June 2020. Sold the brand to Sazerac. Uh, Sazerac, of course, buys the stocks, the lot that they had of those early times in Brown Foreman's uh, Rick Houses. But then, of course, with a new company comes new blenders. And possibly because this was bottled back in 2017 to 2019. Um, you know, by the time they got to these stocks over here, this could have been a different season of grain coming in. It might have imparted different flavors. All I know is there was a flavor shift. So we're going to see what exactly that is. Uh, but the price point was very similar. I think it was still around $25 to $35 for the current incarnation of Early Times Bottled and Bond. Again, still 100 proof. So I just thought it'd be fun to compare. All right, I'm going to take a little sip here. And we're going to get going with the 1924 10-year-old. Oh, my goodness. 100 proof on the nose. Whew, I coated the glass, right? And it is booming bourbon flavor here. Aromatics. Big cherry. And it's more like pie-filling cherry. It's kind of sweet. There's some orange oil, some clove in here. Definitely a lot of oak. You smell a lot of that rich, and it's still on the sweet oak spectrum. You know, typically to me, oaks, when they get really mature, sometimes they'll stay sweet for a long time, and then once they reach over the top, they start getting into the bitter realm. But this one has like almost like a little bit of pecan on the nose. Really nice. A little barrel char, a little smokiness to it on the back end. But up front, mostly cherry driven. And let's go ahead and taste it. Hmm. Well, okay. That's really nice. Medium, just above medium viscosity. Again, with that kind of cherry filling, maybe a little bananas foster in here. And those two tones are 
typically found in the traditional forester. So the distillery does have a profile that lingers in the stills even beyond uh, their set mash bill. But much more on the pecan oak spectrum here. Yeah, once you get past those fruits, that clove, that little bit of cinnamon in there, really nice and rich. There's almost a little bit of a very light plumminess to it. But it is very savory, and I love the orange oil that's in here as well. It's like a spritz of an orange twist in here. That's nice. The one thing I'm searching for and I was kind of noticing was that little smoky phenol that I was picking up on the nose. To me on the palate, it just kind of comes off like barrel char on the back end. Maybe a little bit of like a lightly roasted coffee bean as well. And it's in the finish. It's kind of laid in. But overall, very, very savory. Kind of calls you back to the glass. I kind of want to keep sipping that, but onward and upward, right? I don't know about upward, but we'll see. Okay, so early times, uh, black top, 2017, 2019. That's where these were found in Kentucky. On the nose. It's different. This one is, this was like brown sugar caramel. This is just brown sugar. It's not too sweet, but at only four-ish years, not getting a ton of oak, but it is a good amount of oak in here. Definitely has leather. It's darker overall. When you nose this one, you don't feel like, oh, this is a little too young. No, you feel like this is mature and it's matured well. Almost like a little black cherry element on the fruit. Plums, a little fig, cocoa. Again with the leather, but this is like an older worn leather. And a little right there, a little bit of that apple cider vinegar. I always love that in older bourbons. You'll pick up that polished tone. Here it is again. It's on the edge of that glass. Okay. To the taste. Mm. Come on. $20, $25. That's ridiculous. <laughs> you normally don't go, what were they thinking on the low end of the price spectrum? You see a lot of it on the upper in that days, but mm. medium, just above medium viscosity. I think this is every bit as viscous as this. Again, brown sugar, but so it's not too sweet. There's not any caramel here. This is brown sugar. Man, it maybe even a touch of molasses. The leather, the clove, that black cherry and and it's almost like a fig date combination, but that's, it's below the black cherry and neither, none of those are like vibrant, right? They're just in there mixed in with the dark components. Cocoa powder though, a lot of cocoa powder and a lot of that older leather. The orange oil is in here and it's more than a twist. This is really, really nice and complex. Problem is it's just a drinker, right? That's how this one feels. It's just a drinker. It doesn't like, Go super, ex, you know, ex, uh, exciting on the high ABV or anything like that. This is just something you want to have so that you can pour it. And it's no big deal. You don't have to overthink it. Yeah, that's really, really well done. As far as the nuttiness that I was picking up, the pecans here, this one has a little bit of pecan. Not much else beyond that. And again, it kind of almost feels like it's part of the baked element. Toasted pecan. Yeah. Almost hate to cut that one short. Okay. Early times. Sazerac. Here we go. All right. This one to me shares more of a similarity here than this one does. Um, and I say that because it's a combination of brown sugar caramel, so it's nice and a little sweeter. It's lighter. This one has a little bit of peanut shell in with the pecan, at least on the nose. And when I say peanut shell, again, people are like, what does that mean? Well, it's exactly that. You know, when you taste a peanut, the, the actual nut itself, it's, it's in your face, it's peanut. 
And then if you get the shell part of it, it's not nearly as much and it tastes a little different. It's a little drier, right? That's kind of what I pick up in here. It's a wisp of it. It's not a lot. But it does have, oof, it does have the orange oil. It does have a little bit of the plum and the cherry in here. I like it. It's got a little bit of the vinegar, the little apple cider thing that I love. But let's taste it. It's not bad. Medium. Just well, right at medium, this guy's. This one's just medium. But again, much more caramel, much lighter. And when I say that, it, again, it's like cherry and um, cherry and a little plum, maybe even a little baked apple in this one. Didn't pick that up at all in the black top. Yeah. So the fruits are playing. They're a little vibrant. You get a little peanut shell. That's definitely on the flavor profile. Peanut shell, a little pecan, not much. And it kind of, kind of just does that going into a little moderate amount of oak. It's, it's just a lighter overall bourbon. It feels much younger than here or here. You don't get that really dense and kind of depth to it. But I can see having this in a bar. I can see having this on your shelf and being able to go to it and, not, again, not overthink it. It's only a low-priced bourbon, but it is bottle and bond. And I always recommend if you only have a limited budget, bottle and bond is always probably the best way to go in the bourbon world. So now that I've done those again, I'm going right back over here. Ah, oh, yeah, it's sweeter, it's richer. It's well crafted. You just have to be ready for that oak. That's the only thing. It kind of dried me out a little bit on the sides there. Other than that, it's really well done. Now, 125, do I have a problem with that? Because I'm always in my head, I'm gauging, okay, what's the price to quality ratio? Are we good? Are we overpaying for the quality here? This one feels like I'm overpaying for the quality. This one feels like it should be about, tastes like it should be $80, okay? This one tastes like it should be $50, and it was $20, and this one feels about right. You know, I think it's $25, $35-ish, I think. I'll put it, every, all the details will be in the comments, but that one feels about right, okay? But, you know, if you enjoyed straightforward reviews like this, please consider joining me over at patreon.com slash liquorhound. Uh, with the patron support, I'm able to keep self-purchasing these bottles to review, so you know you're getting straightforward, unbiased reviews. I'm not beholden to any distilleries or corporations. And again, it's with your support that I'm able to keep this Liquor Hound channel going here on YouTube. And of course, I'll give you ad-free, I give you bonus content and stuff like that over there. So again, there's a whole private review library as well that's never been on YouTube. So join us there if you can, but if not, keep leaving all those great comments here, and I'll get back to them just as soon as I can. Everyone have a great day and cheers.